Welcome to episode two of the Obscast, your official podcast for the Sherwood Observatory. My name is Joe Gathercole, and despite only being two episodes in, I have already managed to fall behind schedule for release dates, but for a very good reason. This episode, we will be talking about the upcoming Planetarium and Science Discovery Centre project. So a very special guest today is Steve Wallace, the Planetarium Planning Manager. He suggested quite rightly that it might be worth putting off recording for a few days so he could chase down the latest information and we could have more up-to-date news regarding that project. So he's here right now. Thank you very much for joining me, Steve. Thanks for having me. I hope I got everything right there in the intro. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, and I hope you like the podcast studio that we've had built for you here. It's a... Uh... Looks exactly like the lecture room at the observatory. Yeah, it's amazing. What a <laughs> Good, coincidence. Good feet. Before we get into all the information on the Planetarium and Science Discovery Centre, I want to congratulate you on recently graduating university. Uh, can I ask what you graduated in? Uh, yeah, uh, probably not very surprisingly, uh, astronomy. So a I handy now topic. have a degree in astronomy, yeah. That'd be uh, handy, make you a, even more of an asset than you've been to the society with... <laughs> I look forward to any possible Steve Wallace lectures in the future. Yeah, I've been planning to do one for ages. I've just not had the time. As, as part of the degree, I had to do a, a dissertation. And I, the subject that I chose was uh, the actual scientific search for extraterrestrial life with things like the James Webb Space Telescope. So I've been meaning to turn that dissertation into a, a Wednesday night presentation, but I've, I've just not had time for reasons that will probably become apparent as we carry on talking <laughs> yeah that does sound right up the alley of most people here though the uh it involves james webb and extraterrestrial life so yeah uh, you managed to get a degree at the same time the position of planetarium planning manager was eating away at your study time so let's talk about the big project uh most members will already know or at least have a brief idea of the plans but for newer members could you summarize what's actually being built on the site here next to the existing observatory. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess no one who's been here could have failed to notice the mound on the right-hand side of the drive as you walk down from the car park and the derelict building on the top. So um, hopefully everyone's been underneath that mound where there's a Victorian reservoir that was built in 1886 to store water for, for the area. Uh, if members haven't done so already, I'd recommend uh, listening to the recording or watching the recording of uh, Dave Collins's talk that he did uh, a couple of weeks back. That goes really into the history of the reservoir and why it was built. Uh, so MSAS bought the land that has that reservoir in it back in 2014 and a plan was hatched to turn it into a visitor centre and planetarium. So the reservoir itself will be used as an exhibition space. So what you'll do is you'll come in on a sort of mezzanine level, uh, about two thirds of the way up the wall of the reservoir, go down some stairs or down a lift onto the floor uh, where we'll have a big exhibition space. Uh, you'll go up the stairs or up the lift onto the roof of the reservoir. There'll be a, a cafe there, uh, some meeting room space and a congregation area uh, to go into the planetarium. Uh, and we've uh, got a contractor called RSA Cosmos, who are one of the five worldwide uh, planetarium providers working with us to design up that planetarium. It'll be a 60 seat planetarium, uh, dual 4K uh, projectors. Excellent. That sounds uh, bigger than I ever originally thought it was going to be, like with a cafe on top and uh, different levels. Yeah, it's uh, so the planetarium, just to give an idea of scale. If anyone's been to Think Tank Planetarium in Birmingham or the Planetarium at the Centre for Life in Newcastle, it's the same size as those. Uh, so it's a bit smaller than the one at the uh, Leicester Space Centre. Yes, that's a, that's a, I've been to Leicester. That's a very big dome to have. Yeah, yeah. Well, big in planetarium term means very expensive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to scale it to what we thought we could fill. Yeah. <laughs> Logarithmic scale of cost when you go to building bigger domes yeah it's like telescope mirrors it goes up with the diameter yes <laughs> i wondered if we could talk about timeline and funding um to jump straight into some questions that i think people are itching to know about uh, a timeline for work to begin and is there a rough possible date for cutting the ribbon on the new shiny doors yeah sure so i mean you, you mentioned funding at the beginning the whole program turns on the funding program because without money we we clearly can't build it um, so we were awarded some Towns Fund money, uh, I guess about a year ago now, something like that. Um, and that allowed us to appoint a design team. So back in November 2021, we appointed a design team consisting of the architect, uh, structural and civil engineers, the planetarium provider, uh, and a main contractor. 
So we got some uh, early release money out of the Towns Fund to pay for that stage of the project. Uh, and that's due to finish uh, at the end of September, uh, so uh, a month and a bit's time. Um, and that the end of that stage is marked by submitting a planning application. So that's a, a milestone. Uh, for anyone who's worked in the um, building and design industry, that's called REBA 3. Royal Institute of British Architects have different stages. Um, once the planning application's in, uh, we'll sort of be waiting probably a, a couple of months to start getting feedback on the application. Uh, and then funding permitting, we'll start what's called REBA 4, which is the technical design. So that's when you really get into the nuts and bolts of it, quite literally. And, and you know, things like where are the wall sockets? Um, you know, what's the specification for the lift? What do you make the stairs out of? What's the finish on the walls going to be? You know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so we'll be running through that um in sort of the the second quarter of next year I'm, I'm starting to talk in round numbers here uh if we have the funding then we could uh instruct the the contractor to mobilize the site uh we're currently estimating that it's a 65 week construction program so okay. if you roll through uh then we'll be commissioning in october 2024 and the grand opening will be in november 2024 so basically two and a bit years uh, yeah. give or take um it's as i've said all contingent on funding so um we've got uh the town's fund money that i've already mentioned uh, subject to some due diligence that we're going through at the moment um we've uh, just put in a, a major application for a few million pounds of funding just last weekend um so so that's in play at the moment and um we've got a funding strategy in place now uh, that talks about some private sector funding from from businesses, uh, from beneficiaries. We're going to be running a public subscription scheme. So, you know, a buy a brick type scheme or sponsor a planetarium seat, uh, you know, that sort of yeah, thing. Like sort really of l l large numbers of small scale dormant donations in, in exchange for some form of recognition that you've made the donation. Yeah, and I suppose that kind of involves the public and the local community as well in having something to do with the project. Yeah, I mean, one of the key design features uh, that we've tried to build into all of this is is that if you think about MSAS and, and the look and feel of MSAS, MSAS it's a community organisation. And one of the um, consistent bits of feedback we get from open days and group visits and things like that is that people like the interaction and the, the, the fact that it doesn't feel like a corporate organisation where, you know, you, you, you buy the ticket the, you get to let in through the door and everybody forgets you and you're left on your own. If, if you come to one of our open days, then, you know, it feels like you're very involved with the members and they spend the time to talk to you. So, um, you know, we've kind of wanted to keep that community feel. And I suppose, um, you know, that sort of buy a brick scheme, sponsor receipt type scheme as, a, as an extension of, of, of that, really. Yeah, it definitely does feel like that when you come on an open day rather than just following a... A path round and being on your own it definitely feels like more of a social occasion as well definitely so can i ask what the building work entails as in is it all done at once is it done in phases and will we get to see the progress through different phases if it takes that kind of path that's a good question uh the short answer is i don't know <laughs> Okay. Uh, the, the reason for that is um, the ideal scenario is we build it in one phase so the contractor mobilizes to site and by the time they leave, we have a working planetarium, we have a working science discovery center. That's the ideal case. Yeah. Um, we've probably picked the worst time ever to be trying to raise money when you think about the current economic climate. Yeah. So there is a chance that we won't get all of the money in time uh, on the program I was just talking about before. In, in which case we have got an option to do it in two phases and then raise the money for the second phase. Uh, if we did that, then we'd open the planetarium first and refurbish the floor of the reservoir second, yeah. because the planetarium is going to be the biggest draw. Yeah, yeah. And you can uh, start bringing some money in to do that, I suppose, then once you've... Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at the economics, then it, it's the planetarium that makes the most money as well. Uh, will the existing observatory and lecture room we've got now remain operational and open accessible to society members for the duration of the build or at some point is it ever going to have to shut down just because of the machinery that's going to be around so um 
when we appointed the contractor, the first thing you do is, is go through a schedule of what the client requires out of the project. Uh, so we were very keen to say one of the requirements is that we keep this place open. Um, I mean, there will be some occasions when we'd have to close for a short period of time. For example, you know, we need to redo the road from the edge of Coxmoor Road up to the observatory, um, yeah. you know, so it'll be a bit of disruption there. But what we've said is that we want the contractor to sort of isolate their working area from the observatory. And we've also been very clear that they have to have dust suppression. So, you know, if we have a summer like we're going through at the moment where everything's dry and dusty, yeah. you think about all that excavation work going on, it's going to create dust. What we don't want that to do is to get into the dome and spoil our nice new optics on, on the main telescope. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> So, um, you know, we've been very clear with the contractor that they have to have dust suppression. Okay. Um, the other thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to put a time lapse camera up so that we can, you know, take an image however many seconds and, and then stitch all that together. So you have a sort of fast run through of what the contractor's yeah. doing. Uh, and we're also going to have tours of the construction works as well. So members will be able to, to come along and, and have tours of the site as it's being constructed. I suppose the good thing about the, uh, time lapse video as well as you've got your first dome show i'm ready to yeah i guess yeah yeah i mean one of the things i want to do there is um if you take the reservoir as is it'd be really nice to get a 360 image taken of the reservoir from the middle of yeah, it yeah. Uh, and then when people are assembling for a planetarium show to project that 360 image onto the dome so yeah, we get to see idea. what it was like first yeah um last thing about funding uh, I, I can't remember if you mentioned this in the intro, but how much money is needed and how far do we have left to go? Right. Uh, the answer, uh, the short answer is a lot. And uh, the answer to the second question is quite a long way. Okay. <laughs> so um, at present, our total estimated cost is uh, 6.35 million. Okay. Uh, of which we've raised roughly a third at the moment. Um, so in, in round numbers, we've got 4 million to go. Uh, um, yeah. but you know, we've, uh, we've had a, a fundraising specialist looking at different options for us. Uh, so we've, we've got a big list of grant funding trusts and things like that, that we're going to start applying to now. Um, and you know, so everybody we've talked to says it's a fantastic idea. Uh, so we're pretty confident that we can raise the money. And, and that headline figure that I said includes um, a 10% risk allowance as well, because it it's common practice and construction projects that you have yeah. to carry a risk allowance in case you find anything that you weren't expecting to that's going to cost a bit of money. So it does sound like you've got a big chunk and the rest of it is within reach. Yeah, we've, we've got over two, well, yeah. we've got over two million committed sub subject to you, you know, review and sign off. You, you, nobody writes a check for two million pounds without uh, doing a bit of due diligence. Yeah. Well, if there are any multi-millionaire members listening, there's a chance to get your name on a plaque on the wall. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you you know, um, uh, you know, keep buying those lottery tickets and uh, think of <laughs> yeah. us if you get the big one. Yeah. Um, as for the planetarium dome, uh, I think you said sixty people it will seat. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. Um, and when you think of the planetarium, or when I think of a planetarium, I think of the constellations being shown and you go in there and do some education and teach people about the, the sky uh what else will it be capable of will there be like virtual space tours and could you do documentaries or use it for any more educational purposes as well yeah absolutely um i guess the old picture of a planetarium that quite a lot of people have is is a planetarium run by something uh, called the sky ball which is essentially a, a big ball with a light source in it with with holes poked in it that corresponds to the stars i'm I'm being slightly flippant they're a yeah. lot more technically advanced than that you can get small ones for bedrooms you can and it's kids. basically yeah, yeah it's basically a giant version of one yeah. of those that that's old technology that's how they started uh modern planetaria are basically just hemispherical digital projection systems high definition digital projection systems so you can project what you want on them um so obviously the, the you know the main thing people think of is, is star fields um and planets and stuff like that. So uh, all the main planetarium providers, including RSA Cosmos, have got access to the space agency data. So, uh, for example, when you look at a star field, you're looking at um, you know data gathered by a space satellite, something like Gaia. So all the stars are in the right places and the right brightnesses. If you're looking at planets, 
then you're looking at you know the NASA planetary probe images of planets so it's, it's the real deal uh, but because they're digital systems uh, you know your imagination is really the the limit so um, I've been to a demo where there's been a, a dinosaur running around the planetarium dome for oh, okay. example and you know if you can't get people excited with space and dinosaurs then you're yeah. wasting your time yeah especially with some equipment that good and that you can be that involved in choosing what you have yeah uh, and there's things uh, called full dome shows which are you know high definition animated shows so uh, there was one produced in 2019 for the anniversary of the moon landings which was a a, basically a, a, an animated run through the moon landings from the Apollo launch to, to stepping on the moon. Um, I've been to um, a, a demonstration of, of a music uh, recital in a, in a planetarium dome where the composer created a light show to go with their composition and played that. So it, it's, it's whatever your imagination comes up with, really. A couple of months ago, I went to see a uh, David Berry tribute band in the National uh, Space Centre in their planetarium and they had just uh, shapes bouncing around and different things to do with uh, space as well but then they had just light shows and that was it's a good use for that dome in a, in a commercial way I suppose as well to yeah. sell tickets and get people Absolutely. to Absolutely, I mean a few years ago the uh, dome at the Leicester Space Centre they showed um, the uh, science fiction film uh, Aliens uh, with Sigourney Weaver so if you really want a proper scare then uh, he could have something like that yeah uh, halloween turned into a uh, planetarium yeah. absolutely i, mean, I like that one. idea yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well I, th I think as well before we convert the uh, reservoir we should have a, a special event at, at halloween yeah you know i know a lot of members are helping clean out the the uh, reservoir at the moment to make it more suitable for for visitors and it'd be great to do something on halloween that would be good yeah julian's had some bluetooth down there with his uh atmospheric music playing on a bluetooth yeah. speaker and that was that was really good it just bounces around so we could have you know that's a listen out for that one in the future um it's a specialist building project and requires specialist builders did you say it was cosmos rsa cosmos rsa cosmos yeah so basically what what you have is uh we have the main contractor um and then uh you know they basically coordinate the work so you have a number of different subcontractors you know every, everything from brickies to to people who erect the steel structure to everything but obviously critical for what we want is um uh, the planetarium so rsa cosmos who are a french-based uh, company that that we uh, selected through competitive tender um have been part of the design team from the outset because the the outer structure has to be designed to contain their equipment you know the dome the projection equipment yeah, the, yeah. The, the server room yeah. and everything so they've been a core part of the design team yeah. all the way through excellent and they'll be uh providing the the, the specialists so what what will happen is the main contractor will build the outer weather dome and then they'll hand over a clean space to to rsa cosmos and uh, they'll come in and fit the dome screen fit the projection equipment uh, you know the the uh, operators console the server room and all that sort of stuff excellent um there's also going to be a science discovery center uh, so the whole project's based around the existing structure of a victorian reservoir built in the 1880s um and that's situated right next to the observatory uh, that we already have where we are now um was as I understand it, the Science Discovery Centre is going to be situated in the reservoir. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. So what sort of thing will the Science Discovery Centre contain? So um, members who are around in 2019 might remember the exhibition we did uh, at Mansfield Museum for the 50th anniversary of the uh, moon landings that, that was sponsored by uh, the Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, so that consisted of a load of display cabinets with memorabilia in, uh, we had a, a rocket collection, we had a whole load of pull-ups that went through the, the space race right from Sputnik all the way through to the Apollo program. You know, so you might get something like uh, that in there. So, you know, an exhibition that you could walk through. Yeah. Um, when we do school visits at the moment uh, during the day, we're kind of really restricted by the weather. Uh, so we have to squeeze them at the lecture room at the moment. Uh, you know, when we get school visits, once the new centres open, you know the, the the school class might be on the floor of the reservoir doing activities in there yeah um 
and in the business plan we've even allowed for it being rented out for community use going back to what i was saying before about you know wanting to feel community so you know you could get a, a group renting it out to have a yoga class even you, you okay know, whatever really that makes sense so it's going to be full of learning opportunities basically for yeah. local children will there be any kind of uh resources for mature students or uh just for adults to come and learn as well yeah I, I, it's almost not a distinction uh i mean the the reason why people are giving us funding is because uh, there's a shortage of uh stem qualified people in the area science technology engineering and, and maths and if you look at education attainment would be low national averages or even regional averages in, in, in terms of that so a key part of it is to encourage people to, to follow STEM careers. And I don't think that matters whether you're a child or an adult. You've always got something to learn. Um, I Well, look at me. You, you introduced me as, yeah. as having just got a degree in astronomy. Yeah. Um, you, you know, that's obviously I'm an adult. You might not, um, you know, you, you obviously, obviously look at me and think, yeah, I'm just a student first time round and only 21. But... Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't know you were a mature student. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you, you know, and if you look at the nice school classes we run, you know, that's that's full of adults mostly as, as well. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's everybody. That's good. We can involve everyone from all ages in something we're building there to bring a community and to get interested in STEM yeah. or educational learning in general. Yeah. Um. So with regards to how the planetarium and the science centre and, and the whole thing will work once it's open, the building's all done and it's open and running will it be open all the time with like a staff member at a desk for the public to just turn up and have a look around or will it kind of be appointment and specific events only so um we've had a number of workshops with the trustees to map out how this is going to work once it's open uh so the simple answer is it's going to be by booking only so it's not just going to be a, a walk up pay on the door yeah. come in um because otherwise you're spending a lot of money and a lot of time yeah. sitting around when there might not be anybody there. Uh, so the business plan is based on having two staff members. Uh, one of those will be a, a sort of centre manager and planetarium presenter. Uh, the other one will be essentially a, a events coordinator, marketing, you know, sports, social media, all that sort of stuff. You, you, you know, put out adverts for what we're doing next and things. So it, it broadly breaks out into um three blocks sort of daytime would be mostly school visits um evenings would be the sort of group visits we do already except obviously we've got the planetarium to to use there so the quality of the the shows would be enhanced over just the lecture room um and then between those two when you when you think group visits start 7 seven thirty, that sort of time uh schools go home you know two thirty three o'clock sort of time yeah. the plan would be that we'd sell planetarium show only tickets uh for uh pre-booked uh, between those two times so uh taking advice from uh colin who runs think tank planetarium birmingham is you know your sort of four o'clock to six o'clock seven o'clock slot is the popular time to run a planetarium Excellent. Um, yeah and very very much still relying on on volunteers yeah as well going back to that wanting to feel like a community thing you, you, you know this is going to be run uh, by volunteers as well as the permanent staff well it sounds like a really good way to maximize the use so it's not sitting empty to have those slots like you say because it may as well be being used and being worked yeah at all all the times we can do and obviously a large project that costs money to upkeep so it's handy i guess you could do um business conference meetings and stuff like that could you yeah that's that's right so uh, i mean one of the things we had to do to start getting the funding was to demonstrate it would be financially self-sustaining um once it was running so we weren't constantly relying on grant funding to keep it yeah. running uh, you don't want to turn it into you know one of these olympic developments where you have a fantastic olympics and all the money's invested in it but then you get the tumbleweed blowing through yeah, and the olympics exactly. goes away so um yeah, to, to, to make that, you have things like corporate hires as, as, as well. You, you know, there's even a couple of weddings a year booked in, in, in there yeah. as well. So um, the Centre for Life in Newcastle, they, you know, they, they do weddings in their planetarium dome, yeah. you know, with firework displays on the dome and all sorts of stuff. It, it just sounds like there's endless possibilities once you start talking about the type of things you can do. You could probably 
well if we can do that we can do this if we can do that we can do this yeah and there'll be things we haven't even thought of yet yeah. but the vast bulk of it will be obviously the stuff we do now with the astronomy stuff but but more of it and with expanded facilities uh for uh current members uh will things like society lectures take place in the new building or will we continue to use the existing lecture room that we're in now and uh, will things change much uh, in terms of like the members evenings mondays and wednesdays so when we've been going through the organization of design workshops uh with the uh, with the committee again it comes back to what i was saying before we want it to have a, the proper community feel and the feel that we have at the moment and that was a key part of the organizational design um so what i want to do when i uh book a talk about this and, and hopefully a couple of weeks time need to look at the schedule of wednesday nights what i want to do is present where we got to uh, as a set of trustees with the organizational structure and get feedback from members okay on what they think uh but broadly essentially what you you get all the men members benefits you get now you know the magazine the obscast um you know the members nights uh, the guest speakers yep. all that stuff um including access to the the planetarium so you know if you get a guest speaker um the guest speaker could be doing their presentation in the in the planetarium to the members excellent that sounds good and you know that one one thing and i know and there's a number of members i won't name names are very excited about this we've got all this high-tech kit for the members to play with and write shows themselves yeah that's amazing i mean my my next question was what sort of events could we put on that could interest people in astronomy and stem but i think we've covered loads of stuff there. i don't think we need to try and think of anything else so uh finally before we finish uh ultimately what do you hope the new facilities will achieve both locally within community and on a larger scale for the observatory I, I i have this this picture in my head and and this it might be a long shot but um my, my vision is i'm sitting watching the news one day and there's an article on about astronomy you know maybe the next generation of the james webb telescope or something like that and the principal investigator is sitting being interviewed and the interviewer says what got you first into astronomy and the principal investigator says i had a visit to sherwood observatory planetarium and that got me hooked excellent that would definitely be proof of uh what word am i thinking of <laughs> <laughs> proof that it was all worthwhile I, I, I <laughs> think. But, yeah. but you know that's Success. that's the that's the peak <laughs> of the pyramid yeah but, um you, you know if we can just get more people in the area interested in science technology engineering and maths uh, you know, the, the the reason why Ashfield Council are so keen on this is because those sort of people bring prosperity to, prosperity to an area uh, by, you know, or being the being the employees that local businesses need. So yeah. if we can just play a small part in the prosperity and success of the area, that would be a, a, a fantastic legacy. Well, that sounds like a plan to me. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. It's uh it's been great to have an update and have the insight to what's going on uh is there anything else you want to add that maybe we haven't touched upon uh just watch this space um and uh, i'll do my best to keep you updated with progress the, there's a lot happening at the moment uh but you know we want to get the members involved as much as we can excellent well i'm very excited i think everyone else is very excited uh and it's been a pleasure so thank you very much thank you Well, we are nearly done with this month's episode. I just wanted to point out a couple of astronomical targets for you to keep an eye out for this month and then quickly update you on upcoming news and events for the month. The first target for August will be Saturn, which reaches our position on the 14th of August. This means it's in the opposite direction from the sun from our perspective, so it's very well lit up. This is a great opportunity to view Saturn's rings reflecting the light from the sun. The second target is more like a few targets all at once actually because it's the Perseid meteor shower which will reach its peak on the 11th to the 12th of August. The 12th is a Friday night so perfect for a late night viewing session. Unfortunately the moon has decided to be full that night making seeing more of a challenge but it still should be worth the occasion to see a few fiery balls fall into earth. And as for upcoming news and events of course there are the two usual members nights Monday maintenance nights have really kicked off with work on the reservoir and pumping station 
society members Craig and Banger dealt with the pumping station Ruth and remain uninjured despite, uh, well, everything. And Wednesday members night, so of course, still a great night as well. The next observatory open day will be held on the 20th of August. If you wish to volunteer, which I, I know you do, please email Brendan, our public event coordinator at events at sherwood-observatory.org.uk or just call him at a members evening or a costume in the street. The annual general meeting for MSAS will take place on the 6th of September. If you wish to stand as a trustee, you need to have submitted a personal statement as to your suitability in no more than 200 words by the 19th of August. And finally, on the 30th of August, we have science journalist, science communicator, and the host of the awesome astronomy podcast, Dr. Jennifer Millard. And that's going to be a great one. So don't miss that one. And that is it for episode two. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Steve for coming in and talking to me. Uh, best of luck to him with all the planning and the stress that must come with it. I know we're all very grateful for the work he's doing. And I will see you all next month for the September edition of the Obscast. Thank you for listening to the Obscast, the official podcast of Sherwood Observatory. I've been Joe Gathercall. Special thanks to the Tower of Light for producing our theme tune, and I will see you soon for our next episode.